So today we're going to be reading Chapter 3 of The Magician's Elephant by Kate DiCamalo and illustrated by Yoko Tanaka. One of the things that I want you to think about is we have read Because of Winn-Dixie and The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. And think about the way that Kate DiCamalo writes her characters, the setting she uses and how she intertwines many characters into one story. It's not just about the main character. All of her side characters bring so much to the story. So when we're reading today, think about how everyone is working together and how they all center around this one event of the, uh, this one action of the elephant. All right, so we're gonna read chapter three. The captain of the police of the city of Baltis was a man who believed most firmly in the letter of the law. However, despite repeated and increasingly flustered consult consultations of the police handbook, he could not find one word, one syllable, one letter that pertained to the correct method of dealing with a beast that has appeared out of nowhere, destroying the roof of an opera house and crippling a noble woman. And so, with great reluctance, the captain of police solicited the opinions of his subordinates about what should be done with the elephant. Sir, said one of the young lieutenants, she appeared. Perhaps if we are patient, she will disappear. Does the elephant appear as if she would disappear? said the captain of police. Sir, said the young lieutenant, I am afraid I don't understand the question, sir. I am quite aware of your lack of understanding, said the captain. Your lack of understanding is as apparent as the elephant and is even more unlikely to disappear. Yes, sir, said the lieutenant. He furrowed his brow. He thought for a moment. Thank you, sir, I'm sure. This exchange was followed by a long and painful silence. The gathered policemen shuffled their feet. It is simple, said another policeman finally. The elephant is a criminal. Therefore, she must be tried as a criminal and punished as a criminal. Uh, but what is the elephant's crime? But why is the elephant a criminal? Said a small policeman with a very large mustache. Why is the elephant a criminal? Said the captain of police. Yes, said the small policeman whose name was Leo Matinee. Why, if the magician threw a rock at a window, would you then blame the rock for the window breaking? What kind of magician throws rocks, said the captain of police. What kind of sorry excuse for magic is that, the throwing of rocks? You misunderstand me, sir, said Leo Matinee. I meant only to say that the elephant did not ask to come crashing through the roof of the opera house. Would any sensible elephant wish for such a thing? And if she did not wish for it, then how could she be guilty of it? I ask you for possible solutions, said the captain of police. He put his hands on the top of his head. Yes, said Leo Matinee. I ask what action should be taken, said the captain. He pulled at his hair with both of his hands. Yes, said Leo Matinee again. And you talk to me about sensible elephants and what they wish for, shouted the captain. I think it is pertinent, sir, said Leo Matinee. He thinks it's pertinent, said the captain. He thinks it's pertinent. He pulled at his hair. His face became, become, became very red. Sir, said another policeman, what if we found the elephant a home, sir? Yes, said the captain of police. He turned around and faced the policeman who had just spoken. Why did I not think of it? Let us dispatch the elephant immediately to the home for wayward elephants who engage in an objectionable pursuits against their will. It is right down the street, is it not? Is it? said the policeman. Truly? I had not known. There are so many worthy charitable institutions in this enlightened age. I, why? It's become nearly impossible to keep track of them all. Captain pulled very hard at his hair. Leave me, he said softly. All of you, I will solve this without your help. One by one, the policeman left the police station. The small policeman was the last to go. He lifted his hat to the captain. I wish you a good evening, sir, he said, and I beg that you consider the idea 
that the elephant is guilty of nothing except being an elephant. Leave me, please, said the captain of police. Good evening, sir, said Leo Matinee again. Good evening. The small policeman walked home in the gloom of the e early evening. As he walked, he whistled a sad song and considered the fate of the elephant. To his mind, the captain was asking the wrong questions. The questions that mattered, the questions that needed to be asked were these. Where did the elephant come from? And what did it mean that she had come to the city of Baltice? What if she was just the first in a series of elephants? What if one by one, all the mammals and reptiles of Africa were to be walking down the hill and onto the lighted path? I apologize, guys. I'm, let me repeat. What if she was just the first in a series of elephants? What if one by one, all the mammals and reptiles of Africa were to be summoned to the stages of opera houses all across Europe? Sorry about that, guys. My page is stuck together and I read the wrong page. Let us continue. What if next crocodiles and giraffes and rhinoceroses came crashing through roofs? Leo Matinee had the soul of a poet. And because of this, he liked very much to consider questions that had no answers. He liked to ask what if and why nots and could it possibly be? Leo came to the top of the hill and paused. Below him, the lamp lighters the lamplighter was lighting the lamps that lined the wide avenue. Leo Matinee stood and watched as one by one the globe sprang to life. What if the elephant had come bearing a message of great importance? What if everything was to be irrevocably, undeniably changed by the elephant's arrival? Leo stood at the top of the hill and waited for a long while until the avenue below him as well in Excuse me. Let me repeat that. Leo stood at the top of the hill and waited for a long while until the avenue below him was well and fully lit. And then he continued walking down the hill and onto the lighted path toward his home. He whistled as he walked. What if, why not, could it be, sang the glowing, wandering heart of Leo Matinee. What if, why not, could it be? Peter stood at the window of the attic room of the apartment's polonaise. He heard Leo Matinee before he saw him, always because of the whistling. Peter heard Leo before he saw him. He waited until the policeman appeared, and then he threw open the window and stuck his head out. He shouted, Leo Matinee, is it true that there is an elephant and that she came through the roof and that she is now with the police? Leo stopped and looked up. Peter, he said. He smiled. Peter Augustus Duquesne, fellow resident of the apartment's polonaise, little cuckoo bird of the attic world. There is indeed an elephant, it is true, and it is true also that she is in the custody of the police. The elephant is imprisoned. Where, said Peter. I cannot say, said Leo Matinee. I cannot say because I'm afraid that I do not know. They are keeping it the strictest possible secrets, you see. What with elephants being such dangerous and provoking criminals. Close the window, called Vilma Lutz from his bed. It is winter and it is cold. It is. It was winter, true. And true also, it was quite cold. But even in the summertime, Vilma Lutz, where he was in the grips of his strange fever, would complain of the cold and demand that the window be shut. Thank you said Peter to Leo Matinee. He closed the window and turned and faced the old man. What were you speaking of? said Vilna Lutz. What manner of nonsense were you shouting from windows? An elephant, sir, said Peter. It is true. Leo Matinee said that it is true. An elephant has arrived. An elephant is here. Elephants, said Vilna Lutz. <laughs> oh, imaginary beast, denizens of imaginary beasteries, Demons from who knows where, he fell back against the pillow, exhausted by his diatribe, then jerked suddenly upright again. Hark! Do I hear the crack of muskets, the boom of cannons? No, sir, said Peter. You do not. Demons, elephants, imaginary beast. Not imaginary, said Peter. Real. This elephant is real. 
Leo Matinee is an officer of the law, and he says it is so. <laughs> said Vilna Lutz. I say Puh! to that mustachioed officer of the law and his imagined beat creature. He lay back against the pillow. He turned his head first to one side and then to the other. I hear it, he said. I hear the sounds of battle. The fight has begun. So, said Peter softly to himself, it must be true, mustn't it? There is an elephant now. So the fortune teller was right, and my sister lives. Your sister, said Vilna Lutz, your sister is dead. How often must I tell you? She never drew breath. She did not breathe. They are all dead. Look out over the field and you will see. They are all dead. Your father among them. Look, look, your father lies dead. I see, said Peter. Where is my foot, said Vilna Lutz. He cast a wild look around the room. Where is it? On the nightstand. On the nightstand, sir, corrected Vilna Lutz. On the nightstand, sir, said Peter. There, said the old soldier. He picked up the foot. There, there, old friend. He gave the wooden foot a loving pat, and then he let his head sink back on the pillow. He pulled the blanket under his chin. Soon, he said, soon I will put on the foot, Private Duquesne, and we will practice maneuvers, you and I. We will make a great soldier out of you yet. You will become a man like your father. You will become like him, a soldier brave and true. Peter turned away from Vilna Lutz and looked out the window at the darkening world. Downstairs far below, a door slammed, and then another. He heard the muffled sounds of laughter and knew that Leo Matinee was being welcomed home by his wife. What was it like, Peter wondered, to have someone who knew you would always return and who welcomed you with open arms? He remembered being in a, dark, in a garden at dusk. The sky was purple and the lamps had been lit, and Peter was small. His father picked him up and tossed him hot high, then caught him over and over again. Peter's mother was there, too. She was wearing a white dress that glowed bright in the purple dusk, and her stomach was large like a balloon. Don't drop him, said Peter's mother to his father. Don't you dare drop him. She was laughing. I will not, said his father. I could not, for he is Peter Augustus Duquesne, and he will always return to me. Again and again, Peter's father threw him up in the air. Again and again, Peter felt himself suspended in nothingness for a moment, just a moment. Then he was pulled back, returned to the sweetness of the earth and the warmth of his father's waiting arms. See, said his father to his mother, do you see how he always comes back to me? It was full dark now in the attic room of the apartment's polonaise. The old soldier tossed from side to side in the bed. Close the window, he said. It is winter and it is cold. The garden that held Peter's father and mother seemed far away, so far that he could almost believe that the memory, the garden, had existed in another world entirely. But if the fortune teller was to be believed, and she must be believed, she must. The elephant knew the way to that garden. She could lead him there. Please, said Vilna Lutz. The window must be closed. It is so cold. It is so very, very cold. Well, Peter's beginning to believe the fortune teller. All the information is be starting to become connected. We know that Leo Matinee is a police officer that knows of the elephant and is part of the group that is holding her imprisoned, as well as the magician, but he is also friends with Peter. So I wonder how all of these characters are going to connect to each other. Think about their character characteristics. Do you think that the, um, the chief of police is as sensible as Leo Matinee? He asked some very good questions. You know, did the elephant really commit a crime? Is she really a criminal? Is it her fault that she came crashing through the roof? Those are very good questions. Well, I guess we'll find out more in the next chapter.